Welcome to In the Open with Luke and Joe. I'm your host, Luke Schantz. And here's my co-host, Joe Seppi. And a big welcome to our guest, IBM fellow, John Cohn. Before we get to our show, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you for joining us for another installment of In the Open with Luke and Joe. Today, I am pleased to bring you a conversation with the creative and technical powerhouse, John Cohn. We're going to be talking about the role of play and prototyping in John's work. To explore this theme, we will be digging in to the Veriman project. Veriman is an open source browser-based video instrument. It uses computer vision to track movement and converts those data points into music. But before we welcome our guest, John, let's say hello to our co-host, Joe Seppi. Hey, Luke. How's it going? I am doing well, Joe. Uh, happy to be back on another episode of In the Open with you. Yes. Uh, always a pleasure. Uh, I know we're both in Connecticut, but uh, this weather is crazy. It was, it was like spring was emerging, you know, 70 degree weather. And then April Fool's, we got snow and I've got snow today too. Uh, it's 28 degrees. It's, it's crazy, but uh, you know, it's the weather. That's how it goes. It is. I, and I feel like Connecticut is like a microclimate because you've got this elevation and it's close to the coast. I think you're 30 minutes away and I didn't see any snow. So it's, uh, yeah, I, I think we need to check in on some weather API, like microclimate weather API here. Yeah, we should do that. Do some comparisons here, just the, the, the distance. With Without further ado, though, let's bring in our guest, John Cohn. Hey, John. What? Hey, what you guys talking about snow? I'm in northern Vermont. So I'm looking at a ton of snow. Yesterday, my wife and I were hiking just near the house in in, uh, in waist deep snow. But wow. down where I am in the in the, it's just pretty pretty dusty. Yeah, you're you're way up there uh, near Burlington, right? Yep. yep. Cool. I, I lived in Bennington for a little while. I love I love Vermont. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. But I've lived kind of everywhere. I've been all around. Well, it's great. Yeah, I love it up here. It is like a maker's paradise. So, yeah, it seems like it, right? It's a real kind of creative, yeah, you know, hub, whatever you'd want to call it. Um, One of everything. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, that's really cool. So, before we get into the Veriman project, John, maybe you could give a little bit of a self introduction to our listeners who might not be familiar with uh, your work or wh where you're coming from. Oh my gosh! Well. It all started 62 <laughs> years ago on a snowy day in New York City. No, I was born in New York, uh, and now I'm here. Um, let's see. I grew up to the extent, extent that I grew up in Houston, Texas, uh, in the middle of the space race, you know, 1960s. I wanted to be an astronaut. Wow. And I kind of came to realize I wasn't good enough looking to be an astronaut. So um, actually, my mom just found this article, this little piece of paper that I wrote that said I wanted to go to MIT and I wanted to be an engineer. And I did both of those. So wow. uh, that was a while ago. Yeah. Went to MIT because it was as far from Houston as I could get. Uh, I like Houston. Don't I don't want to sell it short. But no, Houston's Houston, great. Yeah. Houston in the summertime might be a little tough. Yeah. So yeah. But came up here, uh, went to MIT, and have really never escaped the orbit. Uh, started, I'm like a huge, um, let's see, is that backwards? I can no, never. I, that's good. Like say, yeah, this is, I helped form Vomit, Vermont's own MIT club. And uh, <laughs> so uh, I went there as an electrical engineer, um, took my junior year, went to Austria because I thought I wanted to be a historian. Hmm because uh, I heard it was a good future in it, and uh, kind of decided, hell no, I'm going to be an engineer, came back and joined IBM. I, it, you know, I used to hitchhike up here. I had a friend from Texas, and uh, I live in uh, beautiful Jonesville, Vermont, population 600, in a, a slightly haunted schoolhouse with my beautiful IBM-issued wife, and I just started <laughs> my 40th year at this place which wow. is crazy but it's been it's been uh that that's a pretty simple view uh three beautiful kids uh my middle son sam passed away several years ago which i have to get out there soon because it kind of is a part of who i am um have had a really good career life uh enjoy working with people about just geeking out on science yeah yeah that's amazing lots lots of stuff there I i'm curious 
Um, did you, when did you think about IBM and, and sorry, I know we're all IBMers, so I don't want to spend too much time on this, but, but coming up in the space time, the space, you know, uh, time in our country, was there any, I, you know, I know IBM was really involved in that, but were you later on, uh, got involved with IBM? I'm just kind of curious. Well, in answer to your question, Joe, I think about IBM every waking second, of course. <laughs> of course. And IBM is so big that it actually works space time. So you mean space time like. Uh, you know what was really something about it? Because um, I, I said, you know, I wanted to be an astronaut. Like every kid that I knew, male or female, uh, the several of the astronauts' student uh, uh, kids went to our school, and like, um, and I don't, uh, you know, there was the horrible uh, fire in uh, Apollo Eight, and Chaffees went to our school. And I knew the Grissoms, and I, and it was, uh, it was like, it, what was fascinating about it is that everybody was into science and every, you know, everyone wanted to be a scientist and it certainly influenced the way that my brother and I came out. That's uh, yeah. So it definitely, and you know, I, I kind of think that the, the power of, of something like that to, to galvanize everybody's energy is you know, something we, we need to find, you know, maybe climate is it or something. Yeah. Yeah. But to have everybody on board and thinking about the same thing. I mean, you've sort of seen it with uh, the, am I allowed to say COVID? Are we all? Yeah. yeah. But I mean, it, it has been really fascinating from a technology standpoint. However, that's sort of been a major like, okay, we're all going over here. And I think that's been really interesting. So I'm a big yeah. believer in the power of collective enthrallment. Yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. I, I, I feel fortunate. My next door neighbor uh, won the Nobel Prize for virology most recently, and he and his wife are both uh, research virologists. We talk to them all the time, you know, especially with the pandemic. And uh, it's been really fascinating to 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 have those conversations with research virologists. You know, it's really fascinating. wow. You're the closest I'll ever get to a Nobel Prize. <laughs> yeah, that's great. It was yeah. shocking when it was announced. I was like, "Wait, that's Charlie, my neighbor. That's that's, that's amazing. That's fantastic." So, yeah, we made him a, a cake. It was nice. A Nobel cake. That's yep. great. <laughs> cool. I should also say that the main thing is that I'm a nerd. I, this is the, <laughs> if I really had to define myself, I would say I am very, very proud and uh, uh, dedicated nerd. And I, I hope that. I don't know who's out there right now, but I hope that we've got nerds and nerdettes yeah, out there. And for sure. us. Well, that's a great place to parlay into one of the themes that we are going to talk about today, which is the significance of play and, and how that ties into prototyping. And I think it, you know, one of the things I think we're trying to really get to in this show is, you know, trying to, yes, there's business problems to solve. Yes, there's, you know, technical challenges that that happen that we have to deal with. But I think a lot of the best stuff and a lot of what motivates us as engineers and technologists and scientists is this just passion and love for the technology and learning and playing. So I, I know that, you know, maybe set us up for that and let us know your, your methodology there and then how like a project like Veriman comes out of that. Okay. Um, you know, that's something that's, that's a long and a kind of hard one lesson. Um, I've always been nerdy and always been working with my hands. And I recognize that, you know, that's what, you know, doing stuff, projects in my, um, I, I had, my parents were, uh, kind of treated us with benign neglect and didn't care what we did in the, uh, in the garage. So we had all sorts of crazy stuff going on there, my brother and I. Uh, as a matter of fact, when they moved up to Boston, I had to go down and dismantle our lab, and I found, you know, almost World War III worth of chemicals in there. That was kind of interesting. <laughs> but I found that when I went to MIT, particularly, but but also everywhere else I've been, in, in IBM in particular, that the people who you know always come into it with that passion, you know, the the how I'm going to learn. Uh, most people. In, in our fields, electrical engineering, uh, I'm, I'm much more of an electrical engineer than I am a computer person, but, uh, you know, kind of came to it tinkering. And somewhere I started to realize that even in myself and then I noticed in coworkers that you just make less time for it because just stuff comes in, you know, all the things that you got to do and, you know, trying to get promoted and trying to make a living and trying to uh, create a family and, blah, 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 and, you know, if you're not careful, you start to, uh, to kind of lose it. 
And what happened when, uh, for me with play, it started to become back into focus really when I started having kids because uh, like most neurotic Jewish academics, I suck at sports. Am I allowed to say suck? Sure. Am I allowed to say sports? I'm allowed to say whatever. Yeah. Oh, okay, whatever. So, uh, you know, I was not the guy who's going to go throw a football around. That's the oblong one, right? But, yeah. yeah. Uh, I was going to be that uh, that guy. But uh, when you go outside in the backyard and blow stuff up, you know, it was a really nice bonding moment with kids. And I found that the more science kind of stuff, the stuff that I enjoyed that I did with them, the more they got into it. And then I got dragged into their schools and then the neighboring schools. And pretty soon, I think at last count, I've been in, uh, in front of about 60,000 kids. Uh, wow. And especially the weirder I look, the better off that actually works. <laughs> but I mentioned, um, I mentioned about our son's passing. I have three beautiful boys. Um, Max is the oldest who works at Meow Wolf. Do you know about Meow Wolf? No. Go look up Meow Wolf. Oh, it's this amazing. It started in Santa Fe. I digress, but it, it started in Santa Fe, but he is an amazing maker. He has a 5,000 watt cutting laser. He writes code. He welds. He 3D prints. But this is a, an indoor uh, kind of experience park. Started in Santa Fe. They just opened in Las Vegas and they're opening in Boulder soon. So Wow. Anyway, he does that. Our youngest son, Gabe, is a, a biochemist. That's why your your Nobel Prize story. He's a third <laughs> yeah. year third year PhD student in cancer biology. Cool. And our middle son Sam, as I mentioned, uh, passed away in an accident uh, when he was fourteen uh, on vacation in Florida. Which was uh, how long you got? I mean, this that was yeah. a tough thing. Yeah. Surprisingly, though. I found that playing was what brought me back to this world. And mm -hmm. I found specifically making stuff was, was therapeutic, but making stuff with other people, especially kids was just like, Hey, that feels good. And it felt right. And I started making things um, with people and I kind of sort of reflected on this, actually what kind of gelled the thought, I, I, I was doing it, but I didn't really stop and say, you know, that's really my message until our youngest one, Gabe, asked me to give a talk. I was the honors uh, keynote at their graduation, at the high school graduation, which was kind of, you know, in a week, well, we're in a town of 600 people near a town of 4,000 people and everybody knows everyone. And I was all nervous about giving this talk because if you suck, you know, in that size town. But I ended up coming up with the idea that, you know, what would I tell myself if I could go back in time to when I was say 17 or 18? And it was really that I wish I had, uh, well, that I would want to reinforce or, you know, that not to work so hard and to play more. And, and that message, um, I found that to be such a powerful thing, even for work, you know, what we do at IBM is you know, we, We've got technology, we're trying to understand it. The only way to understand stuff is to try it and you know, kind of take that playful attitude. If you, you don't always know something's gonna work, you don't always, you know, uh, use, you don't always use something for its intended purpose. Uh, you sometimes have to break things, you often have to fail, and all of those things kind of this playful, like, can I make something cool? And as I found through my career, kind of moving towards the Veriman question, is that the more cool stuff you make, the easier it is. First of all, I don't like talking about things that I don't know how to do. Uh, you know, it's you're always in this, like in my new job in AI, I'm not an expert yet. I'm trying to learn my way. And that's sort of how I ended up with the Veriman. And I found that doing experiments like that not only helps you grow your own skills, but it's a great icebreaker. It's, it's great, you know, because you could collaborate with, people outside of your organization, you can continue to collaborate with students, even in a client situation, you know, when meetings go horribly wrong, you know, bringing out some gadget that you made that uses, you know, the technology you're doing, it's incredibly, it's an icebreaker and it, you, it's a, a source of collaboration. What happened with the Veriman is kind of a perfect example. I was uh, moving from, I was a uh, chief science of, scientist of the Munich IoT Center which was a super fun job. 
but it meant getting on an airplane every other week to go to Munich from Jonesville, Vermont, because they, they keep saying they're going to build a tunnel and they just never finished it. But, uh, the, um, the, uh, so I was learning more about AI. And when I got to, to uh, the MIT IBM lab, where I work, which is such a super amazing place, we should talk about that. Um, I was thinking, well, I don't know much about AI, so I better start playing around with it and learning. And um, I build Tesla coils. Do you know what those are? Mm -hmm. They're kind of menacing devices that you know send out <laughs> big meter long sparks. And I had this idea that I wanted to use AI to control a Tesla coil. So I, cra I put together something using, um, uh, so I was learning TensorFlow. I'm a PyTorch person now, but TensorFlow. And on top of it, there was a trained model called PoseNet, which is a motion capture thing. They had some great, you know, uh, people who put TensorFlow out and uh, did a really great job of having a bunch of like little demos, little open source demos. And there was a PoseNet thing using TensorJS so that the model actually, it's, you know, runs native in your, in a phone or something. So I started hacking on that and pieced something together with Node-RED. Do you know about Node-RED? Of course. We should talk about Node-RED. Um, uh, I'm the, one of the grand great uncles of Node Red. I'll tell you about that. <laughs> in a second. But um, basically, uh, crafted something crafty together that used PoseNet, a kind of a hacked example, used MQTT, and uh, turned into somewhat beautiful music. Then I was lucky enough to meet uh, somebody in one of the IBM uh, uh, out, uh, developer outreach groups, Va Barbosa. You ever run across yeah, him? Yeah, yeah, Va. Oh, what an amazing guy! He's just yep. great, solid front end, back end, and a good designer. Mm -hmm. And so he helped me take my really crafty, um, uh, you know, multi th three piece kind of thing, and actually make it into something kind of pretty elegant. So yeah. we, so we did that, and I'll tell you. I did it just for fun, did it just as a learning exercise, but I had so much fun with that thing. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was at NeurIPS, which is the, like the main, it's the biggest AI conference in the world. Okay. And I walked into a room, I hope I'm not offending anybody by saying this, but there were a bunch of demos, some from my, our companies, quite a, most from not from our company. And, uh, and they were frankly pretty boring, except for one robot thing that tried to force food into your mouth. That was kind of cool, but most of them were kind of boring. And I sat down next to a friend of mine, another IBM person, and I said, oh, let me show you what I'm working on. I flipped open my laptop, brought up the Veriman, you know, version 0.0.01 .0 or something like that. I was playing around with it. We'll, we'll, we'll show you that. And all of a sudden we had a crowd and I was like, this is good. Yeah. Um, so. And since then, I've used that thing to, uh, again, to, just to interface it. I, I, we were talking before the show. I use it to interface to physical devices. So it runs my Tesla coil. I, you know, it, it, It's a MIDI, uh, MIDI controller. But I've now just recently, with a, another student uh, who was just over the hill, worked out a way of, of creating it as a, a general purpose MQTT interface. So I'm now running a big robot with it and a 30-foot keyboard. What else have I interfaced it to? Anyway, long answer, but because it's fun. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's really cool. There's there's so much there to it, uh, to dig into. Is there a way we can we can kind of show that thing? Yeah, let's get, let's people I just realized I'm talking about it and maybe people ooh, there's Luke. Here is I am. Live? Oh wait, are you you're you look frozen. Uh oh. Are uh -oh. you seeing it, Luke? Uh, you know, let me uh, refresh it here. Got a lot going on. Yeah, let me. I'm gonna fire up mine too. Maybe we can fire jam. up yours. Yep. This is the lesson of uh, you should always make a video backup. I have my MIDI. Oh, keyboard. I have that. I have that. Oh, did you actually hook it into a MIDI keyboard? Uh, I did, but I don't know. I haven't gotten that it, part it, yet. Okay, it takes a little bit of. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll or actually, up. or can I share a screen? Yeah, you can share a screen. But you won't be able to hear me. Is that correct? Maybe Joe, not. I could allow one of my share my Joe, screen. Yeah, yeah, Joe, share your screen. Okay. Share your, share your screen. Let's do this. Uh, share screen. That one's fine. We'll probably get into the weird, like, yep, that thing. Yeah. Yeah. 
Masking it. Yes, I said somewhat beautiful music. And if you actually pull uh, pull down the uh, the uh, well, a yes. couple things. First of all, pull down the yeah there. Uh, you'll see more functions than should ever be there. But you know you can control on PoseNet some of the you know matching accuracy, etc. But you can also uh, turn on several other things. You can turn on how modal it is, like whether it's in a minor key or. And right now, actually, you know, one thing I'm working on right now is my wife is a. Uh, uh, well, I should say my uh, my wife worked at IBM for a while. Her late father-in-law worked there. And between us, we have 84 years of IBM. So she's <laughs> sort of a techno uh, nerd yoga teacher. And do you know what a harmonium is? These kind of things that you, you meditate to. So I'm trying to build a chanting device that uses Veriman. But so it's got some tonal things. You can set the, the, the tone. You can set the... the um, the vertical uh, height fraction, you know, like if you want discrete notes, da, 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 or you want it more continuous. Um, you can also turn, uh, if you have a MIDI controller hooked into your 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 computer, uh, by the way, so far we, you know, it runs on iOS, Android, uh, Windows, and iOS uh, reasonably reliably, but um, it, it can output uh, MIDI, and as I just mentioned, uh, it'll also work with an MQTT broker and will follow your where your nose is and your eyes are, where your shoulders are. Uh, you can get all your whole body, but you can like get like a, a, an idea of where your wrists are. So I have a robot that's arm, uh, it's, it's in pieces right now, but you know, as you go like this, it follows your gaze. So it kind of walks around with you and adjusts to the, the distance that you are, and you can wave your arms around and it's totally insane. Actually. That's really cool. It sounds yeah. amazing. That is so interesting. Two, two thoughts I wanted to mention. I, I love that you uh, have a Tesla coil that, that controls this. And uh, I, I'm a huge Nikola Tesla fan. I used to oh, go ahead. I have seven Tesla coils. <laughs> what? <laughs> as soon as the pandemic's over, Joe and I are taking a oh, yeah. trip up to, trip. to see your Tesla coils. But uh, I'm a huge fan of Tesla. I worked on this opera about Tesla before. So we went down this whole rabbit hole of, of research. And apparently, you know, now people know what this is. Maybe you've seen it at a Maker Fair. But back in the day, apparently he would just turn this thing on in a room full of people and really terrify them. And his attitude was like, what? This is cool. You should just be you should like this. And he really scared people with it. Um, the other thing I was going to mention, this so interesting that you have, you know, Veriman and now you're adapting it, working with your wife. I remember a story that Theremin himself, his wife was a dancer and he made a stage size therapy. He basically turned a whole stage into a theremin so that she could dance and and have the, the performance be both musical and, and dance. Yeah. You know who's uh, really famous is uh, Theremin, uh, his consort. Uh, I don't know what's the appropriate word for, yeah. But uh, uh, Clara Rockmore, you should check her out. So she was like, and she actually, uh, she she died in the 90s. Actually, he died in the 90s too. They, uh, but uh, she was a viol violist, which is, wait, which is bigger, violin or viola? Uh, viola is where you sit with it, right? Almost a cello? No. No, it, it, uh, it's a joke. It's no, they're the same size, just violinist heads are bigger. <laughs> anyway, okay. okay. Uh, um, no, but uh, she was a violist and she actually developed a muscle tremor. And so she performed, you should go check us out. Like she's got this crazy Rachmaninoff and Sanson things playing. And uh, here's another theremin, uh, Leo Lev Theremin. He uh, was in the United States at the time and he had RCA make 100,000 of these theremins because he was pretty sure it was going to replace the piano which he totally got wrong but <laughs> in the uh right before the second world war he moved back to russia and in 1995 right before he died he got he may have actually gotten it after he died uh but he got an award for generate for working on the the bugs that were in the u.s embassy which i thought was kind of interesting oh very interesting yeah yeah, yeah, yeah he was kind of cool um yeah but i've I, i've seen some of that dance stuff do you, do you know Todd Macover at MIT? No. Uh, he's the father of Guitar Hero, but oh. he's done some amazing, you know, full stage kind of interactive sound sets. I do a lot of uh, interactive art as my 
my kind of go-to outside of work. Wow. Um, yeah. So, so much there's to talk about yeah. <laughs> yeah um, but but I think the idea of, of sort of nonsense apply you know real technology applied to nonsense is very effective. Yeah, that's a great concept. I love that. And it's like you said, you know, you may be doing this thing because it's fun or it's nonsense, but you don't know what's actually going to come from it. It's in that sense, it's very much like science, right? Or like pure research. You don't have an outcome necessarily. You need to discover and then. Yeah. And you need exactly, Luke, you need to be open to the fact that you might be on the wrong place. I mean, that it's been very interesting, you know, especially what one of the things that I found that things like the Verum are very useful for is getting people to kind of lean in to like AI. I just uh, have been on uh, the governor of Vermont asked uh, me and a couple uh, a group of other people to uh, on a task force for the for AI. And we started the year before COVID and just kind of finishing up. And uh, one of the things I realized is that there's a lot of misunderstanding and fear and, and kind of non-nuanced conversations going on. So one of the things I'm trying to do is I, we're, we're working on, uh, you know, the, Vermont's kind of a brave little state, you know, and it's small enough that you can get stuff done. We're trying to get more AI, uh, well, actually start by getting more computer science into the, the the schools starting at middle school and then having some stuff about AI where you can get people interested in it. You know, can understand what it can do, what it can't do, what it should do, what it shouldn't do. And actually, you know, a way of starting the conversation with something fun. I'm working with right now, just kind of a parallel thing. Are you, are you familiar with the programming uh, language scratch that Mitch no. Resnick and I Oh yeah. So the good folks at scratch have created a, a really nice extension program. And I'm working with a glow in the dark, brilliant uh, woman, 13 year old woman uh, uh, named Isha, who lives in New Jersey. Um, that is uh, where they have a, they have a plugins construct and they've started to build little AI componentry, including Posnet, the thing that we just showed and the uh, long complicated story, but the, the, uh, Veriman sort of influenced some of that, which was kind of fun. But I'm working with this woman, Isha, on, you know, creating a little curriculum around, you know, make your own AI in, in something like Scratch, which is purely a play, you know, just for fun kind of thing. And I just think it's such a great thing. And, and it, like I say, it, it, it gets your own skills going, but it also gets conversations going. And, it, and uh, my sort of, you know, uh, world domination, <laughs> you know, kind of thing is, I think if you can get kids uh, interested and not just, you know, and, and thoughtful, you know, things like ethics and stuff like that, you can get them talking. It's a great vector to get the rest of society, their parents. And then, you know, so that's my plan for mind control. <laughs> Start with the kids. Yeah. Well, no, I think kids actually are very, very interested in, you know, they're just uh, uh, kids these kids these days, uh, you know, because of open source, you know, when you go into an average high school, you're going to find a group of kids. I, I, I'm very involved in first robotics. You know what that is? Yeah. So I'm the state sort of first robotics, uh, first tech challenge champion. Uh, champion sounds like I did something good. No, I'm, I'm the evangelist yeah. evangelist right and uh you you any high school you go into even in the most remote parts of our our great little remote you know rural state you'll find kids because of the open source things and arduino and raspberry pi that know they can can actually hack together some simple ai so it blows my mind you know yeah it, it it's really interesting. Kids are, are really absorbing all this stuff and, and, you know, they, yeah. Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, I'm not a big Java programmer. You know, I thought that that was sort of what my grandpa used or something. And, uh, but I had a, a high school, uh, junior in South Burlington, Vermont, you know, teach me how to use Android studio to do these robots stuff. I learned so much from that guy, you know, how to use the debugger online and stuff like that. So I think you sometimes go in one of these 
kind of technical humility that you go in kind of going, well, I know everything. I'm going to tell them all about this stuff. And you really learn even, you know, these students can teach you stuff. Yeah. For uh, sure. Yeah. And I don't mean that just metaphorically, like they're smarter than you are. But <laughs> yeah. I am, at least. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. 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 Well, and I think that's one of the most interesting things about a career in technology is that it you're you're never done. It is this constant uh, learning process, and like you said, even if you happen to be a subject domain expert in in you know one area, there's going to be so many things that you don't know about. And if you don't know, it, and while that can be daunting, it's also really positive because it means it's always a good time to get involved. And if you like put some effort in, in a short period of time, like you can kind of get up to speed. It's, it's a, it's a process, right? Yeah. And it's, it's such an interesting thing, Luke. You know, I, I was meditating on that a little bit too, is that, you know, you kind of got to, that goes back to what I just said about maybe technical humility is that if you, I, I've now on my fourth or fifth career at, at IBM or, you know, as a grown up. To the extent that I am, and um, I, uh, you have to when you go into one of those new areas. So I, I was uh, for the for the first for the first thirty years, I, I'm a chip guy. So I I work on the software used to design chips, and uh, you know really know that field. You know just have uh, I have a strict policy of every thirty years you do something different. <laughs> but then since then I, you know I was uh, in a corporate strategy and then help help start the IOT of the internet of things brand and IBM. And then uh, now I'm doing this AI stuff. And each time you go in knowing that you don't know it. And it's uh, again, a playful, you got to be playful because you can't, you can't really fake it till you make it. That's not fair to yourself or to anyone else, you know, and especially as you get more senior, I'm fairly senior in IBM and, and, you know, people expect because they have you know, a title, they expect you to know everything about it. And it, you have to kind of go in there and sort of explain that you're, you're learning, too. And I think that's good messaging. You know, it's good uh, modeling for young career people because nobody, you know, nobody. I'm, I'm the, the scariest thing in the world is when I meet somebody who thinks they know everything. You know? I, I know what I don't know, I, I hope. But uh, that so this has been really a fun exercise trying to retool, you know. Yeah. Learning by torch, for example. Yeah, I, it's good to be humble and 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 open to these sorts of things. And I found that too when I started to when I started at IBM and I was doing more like advocacy and evangelism work and like talking about things. Like it was it was scary. And one of the one of the things I needed to learn was like it's okay to not know everything and to be open to that. And like you have a hard question, I don't know the answer. I'm gonna go try to find it out, and then I'll you know get back to you. And I think that's a uh, you know, a good way to approach things, then you learn and, and you can share that learning and, and yeah. And I think uh, open has just made that so much easier. You know, the, the fact that you can go and find stuff on the outside. And one thing, I don't know how much we're supposed to pitch IBM here, but the thing that I love about it is you can find every kind of person, you know, from Nobel Prize winning physicists to economists to ethnomusicologists, we even had a corporate comedian. You know, you can find it. It's, it's a question of and you know, making sure that you can you can uh, locate those folks. Yeah. And, um, yeah. But I, I I just think that the world is so much better connected now. You know, I, I grew up in a in a my my first love was I was a um, telephone hobbyist. Oh, is that the way? To, yes. Oh, uh, that's a story. So, oh, our, our, what, what does that mean? Is that are we talking about like uh, Erlang, right? Was that the telephone stuff or Luke? Oh, you, you know, I think he's talking, talking about, about uh, phone um, freaking. The, the phone yeah, freaking. Phone yeah, freak. gonna, yeah. yeah, okay. And I got caught when I was. Is this an okay? Is this an okay thread? We can I think edit so. it. In yeah, I think but, so. Yeah, it's a lot. So, uh, it's, it's I, I, I was thinking about how uh, how I learned that. I went down to the Rice University Library, and the good people at Bell System had published all of their in-band signaling and we you know me and my two friends would just go through this stuff and you know that's how and and then there was i remember it was a big innovation so it was a 300 baud you know telephone modem call in that we would change gears with and followed a you know kind of a hacker magazine back then and that all happened when i was a minor so i was told you know when i became 
a real grown up that would disappear. <laughs> and when I was just right before I was going to graduate from MIT, literally you know, three weeks before I was going to graduate, I got hauled into the campus police by, and there was an FBI person there. And there was an incident which I had nothing to do with. I really didn't. I, I, I only found out about what happened uh, afterwards, but they had uh, my expunged record had somehow been respunged, and, uh, and 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 there was a lot of circumstantial evidence. It was one of the people, the, the the guy's girlfriend had the same last name as mine, which is kind of in my culture, sort of like Smith. But they thought they'd caught me, and I was like, well, I, but anyway, but uh, you know, a but. Where was I going? Oh, I was going because in the, the day we had to go like to the library and get those those paper things that they're called books and, and yeah. kind of do it. Now you can just throw stuff out on on the interwebs and you know find people who know people who know people. And I think it's just such it's so fascinating how easy it is to to, to get things started now. I love it. So true. Yeah, it really is. And I, I hear what you're saying. Even if you you know even if you know about, say, one microcontroller platform and you try to dive into another, there is this this learning curve and there's no, you know, read the manual. There's no there's no shortcutting the shortcut. Right. Like it's it's actually like you're saying the information's there. You just got to grab it. Like I, I went crazy around my house this uh, past winter with all of these um, temperature and humidity sensors. So I have like all of these little guys and I put them on all of these uh, like ESP the 32 uh, boards yeah oh yeah, yeah. The, uh, or 8266 and then look I, this is the data i collected i've got this is all the temperatures in different places in my house and now now i'm at the stage where it's like oh i want to analyze this i'm going to build these dashboards could i could i get some kind of like ai custom thermostat we'll, we'll see but this is this is what i've been playing with and it's uh so it's oh, like if you're if you're not comfortable, move three inches to the left. Is that <laughs> well? Well, Luke is redoing his house. I have a lot of meetings with Luke, and so sometimes he's he's like in a bundled up blanket, and <laughs> so like yeah, yeah. It's real, oh. real data there. I uh, I was thinking about a you know that uh, you know your that sort of crowdsourcing of information, and then when I was um, when I was a little boy. You know, uh, I, I, it was shortly after Sam passed, I was in uh, Shanghai and I saw, this was 2007, and I saw um, the, uh, uh, the sign, you know, kind of wall size, building size TV screens at the time. And so I bought some of, you know, now you see this stuff everywhere, but at the time I bought a bunch of this stuff. Uh, th this is, you know, more recent generation. But I couldn't find, there was no, no uh, documentation. You know, the documentation that was there, obviously it was in Chinese, but it was poorly documented. And, and it was all for video. This was for, you know, for wall size video. And so I bought a couple of meters of it to make a hat, of course. And um, I sort of just got on a oscilloscope and tried to reverse engineer what was coming out of the controller because it had a little bespoke controller. And uh, it was early in, um, you know, that was pretty early in the times of things like Make Magazine and stuff. And I put, some, I found a, a, a kid I didn't meet for a de until a decade later um, that uh, could help me figure out how the fades work. But now th this is, again, this is more recent generation stuff. Uh, but I was so amazed that we had actually, we had exchanged all this information. We had put out an open source. It was first on a uh, basic stamp. Remember the basic stamp? And then we had oh, yeah. redone it on uh, uh, PIC controllers. And then we eventually did it on Arduino. And I think some of our code actually ended up in some of the Adafruit stuff that I use now. Um, and it was just this kind of weird group of people kind of coming together to decipher something. We built, uh, I built a thing for Burning Man. You know, I, I go to a festival called Burning Man with a bunch of people. And I bought 20 meters of this stuff for the two wheels. And this, I remember, you know, being up there at three o'clock in the morning, you know, soldering at the top of something, you know, trying to get something to work, which eventually worked, which was good. But I just love this kind of idea of collective, you know, right now in IBM research, we have this idea of, of communities of discovery. You know, the whole idea that that you don't necessarily have to have all the skills in your one little pod to be able to to figure something out. You can kind of put it out there and people can collaborate and still, you know, 
uh, compete in, in, in the open world, but still figure out ways of solving problems that are of mutual interest. I just totally, that was unthinkable in, when I was a uh, tadpole. Tad one, maybe, yeah. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah. No, that's amazing stuff. I, I'm curious, like, what, um, what's going on for you right now and what's what's coming up in the future? Like, what are you kind of excited about that's on the horizon for you? Well, I'm very interested in how you get the public more interested in, in AI. Uh, that's a, one thing. Um, and just in science in general. I'm super fascinated. I was on a project related to COVID. I was uh, peripherally related to the group that uh, just the health passports coming out in New York State. We were working on a, a tool. Uh, we, we've developed a tool for doing uh, uh, contact tracing using Bluetooth, but Bluetooth was inaccurate, you know, because it goes through walls, for example, and it can be, you know, two meters off on a two meter accuracy measurement. So we're using phones, just unaltered phones to do ultrasonic confirmation so you can remove uh, false positives. So. I, I really like this idea of call for and of, of code for good, and I've been very uh, getting more involved in something that IBM does called uh, call for code. So mm -hmm. you know, IBM is a sponsor of call for code, and I believe that you can, you know, if you can turn on that switch in uh, in anyone, but in a student that says she or he can use their technical chops to do some good in the world, you know, so. I think that that's a lifelong, you know, a lifelong enablement. You know, if they can, if you can turn on that, I like doing that. I can do that. And my skills can make a difference in the world. That's just kind of a great magnifier. It's like a fantastic Ponzi scheme. You know, you can kind of, so that is one thing I'm working on. And I'm also, uh, as much as I love, you know, uh, technology for purpose, I'm also, as I said before, a big believer in technology for no reason at all, because it's fun. <laughs> so right now I'm working on a, uh, do you know the band Fish? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So uh, they're Vermont buddies. And so Mike Gordon, the um, bass player's good friend. And in 2013, I built him a 30 foot, uh, me and my friend Homer built him a, uh, a 30 foot keyboard that he, his band, the, his, his own, you know, it was a, a, a interactive so that people who attended the shows and these words, uh, his band was in smaller venues than Fish, but uh, it was an interactive thing that would allow people in the audience to play it. And it was completely beer proof. So, it was in <laughs> these, so now I'm re rigging it to run uh, off of, you know, Easter run on using a, a, a tool called Max MSP. Do you know what that or yeah. Ableton? Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, he wanted to make it simpler because he wants to have it as more of a toy. And so I'm re-rigging it for his house uh, so that it all runs on a Raspberry Pi 4. So that's what I'm doing this afternoon. <laughs> My boss isn't listening. Is he? <laughs> but, uh, but I'm, I'm and actually interfacing it to the Vermin. Of course, cool. for fun, so you can sweep and have it go. But I'm, uh, we're always into making. I think that the idea of spectacle, you know, making uh, uh, science a, a little bit bigger and a little bit more surprising than people expect, is a really good way of getting people into it. I've been doing this for, you know, work with kids and work in schools for now three decades, to the point where you know, their their kids are now. <laughs> uh, you know, kind of being impacted by it, which I totally love. I love it when a kid comes up and says, I remember you came in and yep. shocked the teacher, you know, or whatever. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm, um, I'm looking forward to doing more hands-on stuff. I think it's, I've, uh, uh, I've kind of earned, I believe the time to go putter. So that's what I'm, I'm doing more puttering, puttering for good. Yep. And, and for play. Yeah, definitely for play. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. That's so interesting what you were saying about the communities of discovery. And I just wanted to mention, um, I, I also am involved in the Call for Code, and we just did this podcast for Call for Code. It's all about getting started. And one of the main themes of the podcast is exactly what you just said is, you know, well, first of all, the the starting kits and like the the prompts for Call for Code have expertise baked into them. But really, the, the you know, whether you win or not, the whole process that is outlined there is exactly like this community of discovery that you mentioned, where it's like 
it's it's about getting engaged within that Slack channel, within your own community, finding subject matter experts. Like one of the teams that won, uh, I think last year or the year before, two years ago, Promateo, you know, they didn't win the first year. And then they went and got with an actual wildfire fireman who is an expert in that space. And then having that subject matter expert on the team allowed them to you know revamp the idea and then end up winning and i hear stories over and over like that the more you actually like you know it's a little bit of risk maybe opening up and saying i don't know or asking for help or, or talking to people but the more you actually do that i hear these amazing stories about how you know just fantastic stuff comes out of it yeah um that sends me on two riffs uh one on the call for code thing one of the things that i'm so excited about is actually a mechanical thing so this past year Oh, past year and a half, I helped uh, at MIT. We built a supercomputer named Satori, which is named after my dog, who unfortunately passed away this year. But it was number four green computer in uh, supercomputer in the world. Wow! And the process of doing that, yeah, it's it's been pretty fun because it was, you know, in a kind of storyline, it was built using Power Nine processors, which I. I worked on everything up through Power 7, but they were still using the same design methodology. So I actually had to learn how to use these. <laughs> and I recognized one of the things about, you know, how do you make technology consumable? Because, you know, just trying to get something in use at MIT is really interesting because there's so many, there's 23 different departments, you know, physics, electrical engineering, humanities is one department. But we had so many different things coming at us, we had to make it as simple to use as possible. So we, you know, we really do a lot of work with things like, you know, just simple Python stuff and Jupyter notebooks. And what I'm working on now with the people in global university programs is trying to get the, um, all of, you know, IBM has some fascinating technology around climate. You know, we have things like the uh, weather company, we have pairs, uh, we have a lot of data science stuff. We have uh, the Mayflower, uh, you know, uh, magic boat thing or research, but we have all of these components uh, and they all, um, what we're trying to do is bring them into a single kind of a very consumable component based on OpenShift. So what we're doing is basically creating, you know, uh, like a code ready container that will you be able to come down and in 90 seconds be in Jupyter lab, you know, whether you're running on your laptop or you're running on a, you know, a hosted supercomputer like, uh, like Satori. So I've been spending a lot of time trying to, uh, you know, how, how do you, what's the easiest way to dock, you know, how, how, how do you make something that's intrinsically complex? It, it's rich and deep, but how do you make that accessible? And so, and usable in a form that everyone can see. So I'm spending a lot of time learning, uh, kind of coming backwards from an outsider's perspective to say, okay, uh, here are the tool sets that I can assume that someone would know. How do I make some of our more complex, like, I don't know if you know about pairs, but it's this really cool spatial temporal database, you know, kind of around the sort of community of discovery thing. How do you make that really, really consumable so you don't have to go through a bunch of proprietary interfaces? So I'm learning a lot about that. But can I change, can I can I go back to another thread or do you want me Please. to stop and take a breath? No, no, go ahead. Uh, that, that what you said, Luke, a couple minutes ago about the uh, ability to ask for help, you know, we were kind of riffing on that before. One thing we hadn't talked about, which I, I am contractually incapable of not mentioning in every conversation, is that, um, so I think you know this, Luke, but I was in a reality show a couple of years ago on Discovery, and that was uh, that was a pretty weird experience. And it was kind of a, it was sort of STEM, it was Discovery Channel's show called The Colony. Totally stupid, really <laughs> stupid premise. I mean, it had this ridiculous premise, like that there was this global pandemic. It was really weird because, I mean, actually, there there were ten of us. Well, me and nine crazy people, um, and we're still very close. And we all had this kind of weird uh, early in the pandemic, though we didn't think it was early. Um, we got uh, we do a lot of sort of events, and we all did a virtual event for a, a seventh grade class in 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 Toronto about the pandemic. And I realized as we were all talking that we were all having this kind of post-traumatic reaction to the to the pandemic because that was what we were supposedly living. And even though no one lost touch with reality, but it, it felt very strange. But 
the whole thing kind of going back to what you said lucas that you know it was it was the whole idea of, of inventing under constraint you know that we didn't have the internet that they knew of but you know that that's another story but they did we you know we didn't have the tools we needed etc and we all started by kind of hoarding our projects whatever it was like i'm going to do this all right you know and and if i'm going to succeed everybody's going to know it's mine and blah 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 and we all i remember the moment that it 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 clicked for me that that was that asking for help was not a sign of weakness it was a sign of intelligence but i was <clears throat> trying to turn a car over so i could take out the alternator <clears throat> we were making a uh, a generator that burnt wood that's a long story but and i was going to try to turn this car over by myself and one of the, the my, uh, we, I was hired to be the book smart guy and the, the street smart guy who was, you know, six four and mean. But my dear friend now, you know, came over and said, "Professor, you beep," and you know, he just called four of us and we just picked the car up and went. <laughs> and I was like, hmm. I, it just was a really interesting thing. But the idea of asking for help as a sign of, you know, is not a sign of weakness. And if you're an ability to give help, you know, do it freely. That's really what's behind open source, right? You know, it was it was just a really fundamentally cool. Uh, that was a cool event. Yeah, that's interesting. I I don't want to use the word like successful, but I think people who are able to ask for help and recognize like these gaps that they may have to help them to you know further whatever it is they're working on. You know, that's how you you know again I don't want to use the word success, but how you how you reach what your goal is, right? You know, yeah. I think you redefine success. You know, if you defines success as something that is a, a a rarefied component that if you get some of mine i have less you do you act in a wrong way if you say well like you said joe if you if you if if the the success is achieving the goal whatever it takes then my success is your success and that's a really that's fundamentally what open source is right yeah exactly yep. yeah I think a lot of our listeners might be familiar with the cloud side of that, right? How that happened, how we've we've gotten from, you know, having to build your own DIY infrastructure as a service, monitoring and and all of this. But back to what you this totally brought back memories when you mentioned basic stamp and pick chip. I remember when uh, I had gone back to school for for new media stuff and you know to do a project that involved electronics you needed this whole little team it was like a big deal and you'd make this like really janky prototype board and like everybody would just do that over and over and over and never really achieve like a level of excellence from the project and then fast forward two or three years later, you know, I'm using the, it was the wiring board then it was pre, like kind of pre Arduino, but the wiring board, you know, by myself now I'm able, to, I, I was able to do this, you know, quite elaborate for the time I was using Max MSP, I'm using the wiring board and I'm creating this interactive like museum exhibit. And, you know, it just, it goes to show for years and years, people were kind of recreating the wheel over and over. But then as soon as it got into an open source place, you could just go right to creating that yeah, differentiating you just value. Level, you raise the level of innovation, exactly. And I think the maker movement. Wait, Luke, was it you that, did you work at Third Ward? Yeah, yeah, I had a oh. studio there and I oh taught classes there. I, I was one of the first to teach the 3D printing in New York. I had a, one of the early maker bots and stuff. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, because I think that's when it started to hit me that that what was happening in the software world, you know, was actually able to happen in the physical world. Just a quick, I'm just remembering this. Uh, my oldest son, our oldest son who works at Meow Wolf, used to live in a 147 foot derelict ferry boat that was just outside Luke's window. Do you remember that story I was telling you about? Yeah. I do, uh, I do remember yeah. this boat too. It's still there, the Shamanchi. Yeah, if you go on, uh, if you go in, um, Google Maps and look up where Third World was, uh, where Third Ward was. Say that twice um, <laughs> on Morgan Ave. The boat is still there, and it's hard to miss. You know, you can go and you can just go down and you can see it. You can even see the swimming pool and the roof. Where I I always remember because I would go down there when I was working in Armont, and my wife and I, or if she was with me, or or I would we would camp on the roof of the building because the 147 foot boat was kind of a pirate 
you know, hippie hangout and it, it was impossible to sleep. So I would sleep on the top, <laughs> and, uh, you know, looking at third ward. And then at 530, when the, when the airplanes from JFK started taking out, I'd put on my sport jacket and drive to Armo. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. How oh, cool. Armok being that. IBM headquarters. Yep. Me. Yep. Yeah, I, I used to live over in Westchester, and uh, and then when I started working at, at IBM, just like four years ago, I'm kind of an infant in IBM terms. Uh, but you like you couldn't throw a stick without hitting an IBMer. And uh, at the local cafe, I met this couple, and and uh, you know they're like 88 and 91, and the guy like you know retired from IBM, and he worked there for 50 years. He created the computerized uh, EKG uh, machine, and um, uh, what's his name? Uh, maybe you even know him. Ray. Ralph. Ray. Um, gosh, I'm forgetting his last name. Well, we'll connect later and, and share that. But Not Ralph Gomery, is it? No. Uh, I can't remember his last name now. It was mm -hmm. Ray something or other. I'll look it up maybe in a second. Um, but just amazing. You know, so many people that were doing interesting things through the years there. That's such an amazing family. Uh, and, you know, in the diaspora, the you know people who are still in there and people who have retired and moved to other places. It is like the biggest family in the world. You know, I, I one of the things that was very interesting about this last year, uh, until I, I started working at, at the MIT lab uh, at the very, very end of 2018. But before that, I spent my entire adult life, you know, traveling all over the place and, and had so many friends in IBM. Uh, it was very interesting this year. I don't know if you both felt that is how much I miss the human contact. Also, how much I now realize that we could travel a whole lot less. I'm glad I got to, but it was it was very interesting though. But what a what an incredible community of people. I know. Uh, Ray Bonner, that's who it was. Oh, uh -huh. I knew it. Yeah. You know Ray? No, I know who he is. No, he's okay. before my time, but we were. Yeah, he's he's amazing. He and his wife are really sweet people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I was actually born in West in Ardsley, do you know where that is? Yeah. Uh, but, but then my parents moved to Houston because my dad was a sports promoter, which was very interesting. But we still found some, I don't know what we used to talk about, but we, we were like on two different planets. But yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I thought about this early on. Um, Houston and Burlington actually seem kind of similar to me. Like they're sort of creative places that you know have am i am i crazy i don't know this no. uh, i would say that burlington has not discovered mexican food <laughs> uh you know i love houston yeah it's got a great art culture actually yeah i mean i guess it, it so does. there's a very cool uh there's a very cool kind of uh avant-garde art and music thing there that I was super into. Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm thinking about too. I I, I drove around the country for a while uh, once and played a show there um, and it was this open warehouse and there are a bunch of, you know, punk kids and creative types running around and it just seemed really rich, you know, with that sort of. Yeah, my, my brother, uh, who is kind of a world famous surgeon inventor guy down there had, was part of a group called the Urban Animals that they were, uh, Remember uh, street skating? You know, like they they had this whole punk rock street skating inventing club thing, and this was in the seventies and eighties. You know, it was like what was going on? And uh, let's just say that wasn't the Texas of my youth, but it was really it's a very cool place. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll have to meditate on the you know Burlington is the Houston of the of northwestern Vermont. So, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, it must be the climate. Is Rocky Erickson from Houston? I don't know if you're familiar with Rocky from no. the 13th, 13th floor elevators. Oh my gosh, I love the 13th floor elevators, but yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. He was the lead singer, guitar player, and they were in Texas, and uh, that's a whole other story. I'm, I'm kind of an Americana, Towns Van Zandt, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm a lousy guitar player. but I love Towns. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He took a hit off my beer. <laughs> and Jerry Jeff Walker died. Did you hear that? Oh, I God. didn't hear that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Mm. yeah I think we should continue this conversation <laughs> on. Uh, oh, sorry. sorry, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, no, no, no. I meant these are actually topics that Joe and I are talking about. We're like we should have 
uh, another uh, like um, hobby podcast where we talk more about the the arts and culture. And I think we're going to do that. Yeah. You know, I find that 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 in any professional setting, like this, of course, professional setting, that when you start getting into people's individual passions, that is always very, very interesting thread. And especially when you can mix them, that's the whole yeah. taking back to the technical play, you yeah. know, where I've met musicians and, and, uh, and uh, artists. That's, yeah. that's been my whole thing is trying to enable, I'm not artistic or musical, but I love helping give somebody a technical boost who's got a vision an artist or a musician. Yeah. And, and it seems like, uh, I think the three of us are good examples. Like I, I'm finding at IBM that there's enough freedom to kind of bring some of your creativity to your work, you know? Absolutely. And, and you know, I, I hope it's okay to say this. You know, people ask me like, how could you live in a big company like that? And I have found it to be the most amazing playground, even though, you know, most of my career I've been doing real, you know, hardcore delivery of real products and stuff like that. I think that, you know, just the range of passions that, that people bring to it. Uh, and I think the company has this, you know, it gets kind of trite. They call it, the, you know, the culture of wild ducks. Yeah. And and I think, uh, you know, on a day to day basis, you kind of go, you know, where is that culture? But honestly, the people I know who have been most successful there and last the longest have have that culture. And I bet that's this. I bet that's true in other big companies. You know, you have to develop sort of account, you know, you need a culture and then you can have a counterculture. But I think our countercultures are really where, where a lot of our, our spark comes to feed back into our culture. Yeah. And I'm finding too, like the wild duck stuff is sometimes just under the surface and you, 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 there's something there. And then you're like, Oh, like I, I was sharing something with a friend, uh, a colleague and, and, and it was my music stuff. And he's like, Oh, this reminds me of music back in Chicago. Not too long ago. I was like, well, I, you still live in Chicago and a lot of these songs I wrote when I was, you know, and it's like, Oh wow. Okay. You, you've got a little wild duck underneath uh, the surface too. It's interesting. And you know, what's interesting. Can I, can I, are we out of time or can I riff on wild duck? You can riff. Yeah. Now let's go. Um, so one thing that was very interesting is this whole wild duck thing. It was, uh, it was uh, one of our founders, you know, it was uh, uh, DJ Watson senior, I think who talked about wild duck. It's a, it's a, you know, a, a Danish uh, kind of a child story about a, a duck that went the wrong way, you know, blah, blah, blah. But we sometimes paint that as being, you know, somebody who looks crazy or acts crazy or says crazy stuff, but it's really something very different. And I, a couple of years ago, uh, we had one of these value jams things, you know, the IBM puts everybody together and says, what do we collectively believe? And and I, I give people, I give us great points for really, you know, really trying to do that. And um, there was, you know, the treasure your wild ducks was, you know, theme 47 or something, you know, it was one of those things. And I got called to uh, on a Friday to be in, in New York city on Tuesday, because they were going to film something on wild ducks. And I'm uh, honestly, you know, just cause I got crazy hair, I, I just cut it, but you know, People say, oh, you're a wild duck. And, and and it's really not that. It's not that you look crazy or act crazy or say crazy stuff. It's really that idea of sort of being persistent about a uh, an idea that isn't popular, you know, just doing it because you know it's the right thing, even if it's not the right thing. And uh, I kind of sat there as we were filming these short segments and one after the other, my colleague got up and told some crazy story of something that, you know, some thing where they had fixed the world. And I was like, uh, not going to do that. So when I had a turn to talk, I talked about actually it was a technician that I worked with Doug Llewellyn, uh, back in the day in Burlington. And he, he was a quiet guy, still quiet guy. Um, and he had a crazy idea about how to do layout for these memory chips. And he just persisted and persisted and persisted. And, Everyone, including myself, kept telling me he was wrong, and, you know, and and he got me to do a little code, and then and my code is terrible. And so they saw my code, and they said, "Let me redo that for you." And anyway, in the end, his idea prevailed, and it really, really made a big difference. And it wasn't because he was wild or flamboyantly crazy or, you know, real out there. It was because he had this crazy idea, and he knew it was right. And I thought that was so. That's the story I told, and I just told it again. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's but, great. Uh, 
wild. Here's to the wild ducks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I really uh, th that resonates, and I that's been my experience as well. Uh, when when uh, you know for work stuff, everybody I've ever reached out to has been nothing but gracious, especially with like you know becoming a podcast guest and and you know, or other things that are more like you're saying deliverable based. People have been really gracious, but. Once you get to know folks and you scratch the surface a little bit, you find these really interesting, you know, like maybe they're into crafting or maybe they're into some sort of, you know, really enthusiastic into some sort of sport like, you know, cycling. And it, it really is an amazing uh, ecosystem of folks. And what's what I've learned, too, over the past few years is how much it overlaps with that open source community we talked about pretty much throughout every significant open source community. You know, you're going to find IBMers contributing and it's uh and, and yeah, I think it's a technical generosity. You know, you, you sort of get that idea as, you know, it, 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 uh, you know, you pay it forward. You know, it, it comes back to you indirectly somehow, or even if it doesn't, it doesn't matter. But I think that that's just, that's one of the most phenomenal, you know, inventions of the internet. Or I, I think it really comes from that because I think it allowed people at any point to contribute at any level, you know, totally flattened that. You didn't have to be part of a big organization or anything like that. And I think that is a huge uh, improvement in our humanity, you know, because I don't, you know, it's not just a technical thing, you know, it's the ability to, to contribute on whatever level at whatever place on equal footing with, you know, big, big institutions, small institutions. I would love, I love that. Yeah, I think contribute and collaborate, you know, work together too, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you're right, even outside of tech, I went to this, uh, it was called Orbital Boot Camp, and it was like kind of a personal development uh, thing. It was right before I got the job at IBM. And one of the things, for, it was this guy, Gary Chow in New York, uh, it was in the former uh, Kickstarter uh, uh headquarters but one yeah. of the things they talk about there and i think it really resonates with the open source software uh but again could be applicable to anything is working in the open is is amazing because you might think you know what you're looking for but if you work in the open and people see that things are going to find you that you never would have even considered yeah. because you put it out there right whether exactly. it could be as simple as blogging right just blog about what you're doing and opportunities that you never could have imagined are going to find you. And I really, it's almost, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say in the open, you know, that's where we are. Yeah. And I think that it's kind of weird because it's sort of almost metaphysical that you can manifest things. Like if you just put it out there, then things show up. I'm, I'm finding this conversation a little bit like that as I'm trying to metamorphosize myself for my, you know, this new decade of my life and, you know, trying to figure that out. I, I just think that it's pretty, pretty amazing. I, I, it gives me great, you know, even in these really struggling, you know, these are tough times, right. But it give, gives me this great sense of optimism and uh, kind of expectation. What's going to show up in my, my inbox, yeah. you know, and like just two days ago, I had a reunion, uh, just kind of a chance reunion. I was an exchange student when I was a junior in college. And uh, I hadn't seen some of these people in 41 years. And for some reason, I still, uh, I had bought a car. This was in Austria, but the guy was actually, had left a car in Houston. And I bought this Volkswagen van, 70, 1971 Volkswagen van, Maggie, from him, sight unseen. And we were on this reunion and I, I whipped out this key and he sent me this long letter about the, the history of that, well, that car, which I hope is still driving around somewhere in California. <laughs> but I was just like, oh my God, this was just like, just a, came out of the cosmos to just the perfect time to, to, to sort of reconnect across four decades. Just love it. Yeah, yeah, cosmic collaboration. Yeah. So. I think we should wrap it for today, but John, I think sure. this has been a great conversation and what we should do actually is let's, let's check back in soon. Let's, uh, let's have you back on, uh, maybe in the summer after you've, you've been working on a few things. Maybe we, yeah. uh, you could tell us, uh, tell us what you've been up to. Yeah. I've, I've got a couple of projects that'll probably be, uh, I've, I'm working on a medical device right now. I think maybe I'd be able to talk about that a little bit and yeah, the, I would love that, and I'll I'll, I'll tune in. I, I'm really glad to to know you both, and and I'll, I'll tune in because I 
sounds like there's uh, a couple of friends have mentioned that they listen to it. So I'm going to start listening to it too. <laughs> That's great. And next time yeah. I, I was, I was told that you blow things up. So next time we got to, we got to work that in too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> do you have time for another story? Oh, absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Uh, this is a kind of sad one. It's a very sad one. Uh, uh, my really good friend, uh, Scott, who's one of the guys who's helped me build uh, four of my Tesla coils. He's just an amazing inventor. Yeah, kind of a quiet guy, uh, but very uh, just real technical, passionate guy. Super, super smart. Um, he's working his way through uh, pancreatic cancer and just had a bunch of uh, gear. And we have had... A, a, not just high voltage is a common hobby, but uh, chemistry and pyrotechnics in particular. And I'm, you'll notice I'm sitting on this side of the yoga space because that side of the yoga space is not safe to sit on. But uh, Scott had a whole bunch of chemicals and he just was thinking about you know life and we had to try to get, you know uh, he wanted me to find homes for them. So we, we actually found um, that the university, I'm a professor at the University of Vermont as well, and that the actually let me just think about whether i should say all this yeah i think this is okay but we so a lot of the chemistry uh gear that we had which was a lot of it was uh pyrotechnic stuff that the department of chemistry took because they use it for doing that like our youngest son you know knows this guy who does all these chemistry demos but i found that there were two chemicals in there which you know, had it come to light, you know, guys with hazmat suits would go over to my friend's house, you know, and I would, so this morning I had to go do one of these weird, I had a appointment to meet with the, um, with the hazardous waste folks and had to sign all those papers and get rid of this stuff. And it, it they weren't particularly, dead. well, one was, one was toxic, mercury. You know, so which luckily is going to get re reused, and another happens to be, you know, it was something that we had ready access to, but is now thanks to Breaking Bad considered not good to have. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was really something. It was still kind of sweet, um, but anyway. So yeah, we can talk about pyrotechnics. Yeah, uh, I I love pyrotechnics. In, yeah, but uh, safety third, as we say. <laughs> Well, and what once once we're sort of safe to be visiting and traveling again, I feel like that would be ripe for yeah. making a, a a YouTube video or of some sort oh, of uh, pyrotechnic go, demonstration. Go look at um, th I, there's a little bit. It, go look up uh, innovation through play, uh, a video that it. I did with Ogilvy. I I I, uh, I saw that. I actually shared it with my family. But I found it the uh, half hour before the show. It's like, oh, this is uh, John, the guy we're talking with today, and it's a really amazing video. Oh, it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. So, In fact, yeah. let me see if I can find it really quickly and put it up on there before uh, uh, we close the stream. Oh, yeah. Let's put the link up to it. Uh, let's see. Boom. Add banner. That work. Show. I think that's. Is this it? There's no, that. That's part of it. But here, let me let me just. Uh, I think the video uh, is in that page. Oh, right? it might be. Yeah. Well, uh, I was told that it had a little bit too much fire for work and that's a work <laughs> here uh can i is is there a oh here's here's a ah, ah. It, you... um there is a, so, uh, there's a, a kind of a weird uh uh there's a youtube copy of it low res youtube copy out there called if you look up innovation through play youtube okay We'll do that. But that's not. That's not the. There's a, a better Vimeo one that was done by Sam Mazur, uh, who was at Ogilvy at the time. Cool. Um, and I'll put it in the show note. I'll add it to the okay. Sure. The note on YouTube, and when we we're gonna cross publish this as a podcast, I'll put it in the the podcast sure. notes. Yeah, I'll I'll All look right. at you and, and tweet it out uh, the thread of uh, the the show today. So we'll share. Great. It. Super yeah. fun talking to you both. Really yeah. great. And Same I'm here. really looking forward. I'll I'll be listening uh, going forward. So thank you very much for having me. Yeah, thank you, John. I'd love to talk to you more too about you know we're I don't know if this was pre show, but the Node Space and Node Red and and you know. All that oh stuff. yeah, yeah. Uh, so Nick O'Leary of No Grid is yeah. uh, now he's actually going to go and and be the CTO of a of a nonprofit that's pushing that. That was yeah. done, by the way, as a, a, a No Grid was started as a hackathon project. Yeah, yeah. Nick Nick's a good friend of mine. We 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 chat regularly. So uh, it's, yeah. 
Let's tell him uh, close the loop. Tell him hi. I just talked to him actually. <laughs> okay, great. I will. Yeah. I will. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So much fun. I really appreciate you uh, taking. Likewise, the time. it's yeah. so great, and it's like you know, this is what it's about. You know, it's yep. kind of building the web here. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. This was such a great way to end a week. It really was. So yeah. Go out there. Go make something beautiful. Thank you. Been a, been a pleasure, John. Thank you. Yeah. Likewise. Bye bye. Yeah. Cheers.